So as I said, we'll be looking at this passage for those of you who have got a physical copy or a soft copy of your Bibles. Just keep those Bibles open. We'll be going through this text. But before we get to the text itself, I would like to share with you a few things just in the background of the understanding of Psalm 51. I'm sure these things are very crucial and very important for us to appreciate what the psalmist, who happens to be David, is talking about in Psalm 51, which is a prayer of confession. I've got quite a few things that I want to share with you quickly before we get to the text. The first one is to uh, talk about the nature of Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is a penitential psalm. Psalm 51 is a penitential psalm. It is traditionally categorized as one of the seven penitential psalms. Penitential psalms are traditionally associated with repentance, associated with contrition, associated with forgiveness of sin and seeking of God's mercy. Now we traditionally have seven of them in the book of Psalms. We have Psalm number six, Psalm 32, 38, 51, the one that we are dealing with this afternoon, Psalm 102, Psalm 130, and Psalm 141. These are the seven uh, penitential Psalms, even though when you go through the whole book of Psalms, you should be able to get many other various Psalms that are dealing with the condition of a human being, the <coughs> sinfulness of uh, the human and the fallenness and also the grace of God. But these are the seven that are traditionally known as penitential psalms, psalms of repentance and confession and forgiveness of sin. Out of these seven, 51, Psalm 51 is the most well known by so many people and it was used in history for individual lament or prayer of confession even by community of believers. That's the first thing I want us to know. Psalm 51 is a penitential psalm. It's a prayer of confession. It's a prayer of repentance and seeking God's mercy. Number two, Psalm 51 is a Pauline psalm. It's a psalm of the Apostle Paul, so to speak. You may be surprised because you know for sure that Paul did not live in the Old Testament and the Apostle Paul was not the writer of this particular psalm. And if you pay attention at the beginning of this psalm, you will know that actually it was written by King David. But this psalm, it was known by reformers as the psalm of Paul or the Pauline psalm. Martin Luther, who was the German reformer, he was once asked by his friends, what were the best psalms according to him? And his answer was the best psalms in the whole book of Psalm, they are those of Paul. Actually, he said it in Latin, Salmi Paulini. Those written somewhere by the Apostle Paul. Not really written by Paul, but he said those of Paul. And now when they ask him, can you tell us a little bit about those Psalms? What are those Psalms? And then he picked out of the seven penitential Psalms. He said Psalm 32 and 51, the one we are dealing with, and 130, which was his favorite and 143. So it is one of the Psalms that he would label of Paul, or the Pauline Psalms. Now when you ask him, but why? Because they were not actually written by the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul is a New Testament figure. But how come these Psalms are labeled as of Paul? Not because they were written by the Apostle Paul, but because of the theology that is actually found in these Psalms, Psalm 32, 51, 130, which was the favorite of Martin Luther, and 143. When you get through these Psalms, including the one we are dealing with, 51, today, you will see that the condemnability of the human nature and the freeness of God's grace and the spiritual nature of God's redemptive power they are very much well expressed in these particular Psalms in a way that you find in the book of the Apostle Paul. Exactly when you get the book of Romans, for instance, or the book of Galatians, 
uh, you will see how the Apostle Paul paints the picture of the vulnerability and desperation of the human nature and he explains and expands in depth about the grace of the living God and also about the redemptive power of God. It is exactly what you get from these Psalms. For this very reason, Luther would call them, these are Pauline Psalms, the Psalms of the Apostle Paul. That's the second thing I want us to get at the back of our mind as we go through this. Psalm 51 is of Paul. And the last thing, uh, just before we get to the text, is that Psalm 51 has got a special message, a special message for several groups of people. And you might be one of these groups, so much that this afternoon you won't be spared. Actually, you'll get a share as we go through Psalm 51. It has got a special message for several groups of people. First, Psalm 51 is for those who have never come to grips of to grips with the horror of sin and the magnitude of God's grace. Let me say that again. Psalm 51 is for those who have never come to grips with the horror, the seriousness of human sin and the magnitude of divine grace. Why am I saying this? Because quite often the grace of God becomes meaningless. And certainly sometimes the grace of God is less than amazing grace because we lose sight of the depth of our depravity. When you don't actually understand or appreciate the seriousness of sin and the seriousness of how much you and I we are depraved, it will be very difficult to appreciate the grace of the Lord you won't be able to understand the concept of how amazing the grace of God is. You must, first and foremost, understand the depth of the depravity of a human nature, of how serious sin is. In my systematic theology, one of the doctrines that I appreciated very much was the doctrine of sin. Sin is real. Sin is not an illusion. Sin is everywhere you see where human being is. And it has actually contaminated every aspect of our lives. Every single room of who you are has been tainted with sin. And you need to understand how sin has devastated all of us and we are all corrupt, the depth and the seriousness of sin. It's only when you get there you will be able to appreciate the concept of the grace of God, how amazing and how great it is. And then David in Psalm 51 helps us on both counts by describing the graphic detail of the reality of sin in Psalm 51. But also on the, end, on the other end, he tells us a little bit about the grace of God, God who is a forgiving father. This is the first group of people that will get a share in Psalm 51, those who have never come to the point of appreciating how depraved we are, how seriously affected by sin we are as human beings, regardless of the color of our skin, regardless of our tribal groups or wherever we come from, sin is the dangerous and dead thing that has destroyed the whole world. Actually, this is the most dangerous virus in the world. We are all born with it. It has never left anyone. We are all born in that. When you come to that, you understand how depraved we are, dear friend. On the other end, you'll be able to appreciate the amazing grace of the living God. You are one of those Then Psalm 51 has got a share for you. The second group of people, Psalm 51, is for those who think that we have some people who are immune to sin. We have people on this planet who are too high to sin or to fall into sin. We have people who are too holy to fall into sin. Sometimes we tend to think like that. Such and such person is too high to fall. Such and such pastor I know is too holy to fall into sin. If you are one of those who think like that, Psalm 51 has got to share with you. Because Psalm 51 describes the experience of David. David who was the king of Israel. David who was the man described in the Bible as man after God's own heart. 
David was higher there. He was a great king. In fact, in the old Bible, David is the second person to be specifically and explicitly mentioned as the great. We know the, the Bible has got great men of God and great women of God, but we only have four people in the entire Bible who are explicitly mentioned as great people. The first one is Abraham. God promised him to give him a great name. I will make you great. And the second one is King David. In the book of Psalms, David is explicitly given the label of a great king. He's great. In the, old, in the New Testament, we have John. John the Baptist, even if he never performed any miracle, but he is perceived from the biblical perspective as a great prophet. He will be great. This is what the angel said when he visited the mother, I mean the father, when he was praying in the temple. And the last great man, specifically in the Bible, is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. We only have four people in the Bible who are explicitly mentioned as great people, and David is one of them. And even if David was a great man, but we see him falling into sin. So if you think there are people who are too high to fall on this planet, who are immune to sin, then the book of Psalm 51 will go, is going to prove you otherwise. And you've got also a share. When you are seated with there, or I am preaching here, we are not too high to fall, dear friend. We are not immune to sin. Regardless of the titles people give and the fame that you have everywhere you go, you are a human being and you can fall at any time. Remember, in the Bible, the strongest person we have, physically strong, at some point he compromised and fell into sin. Samson was the strongest man we know in the Bible, but he compromised and he fell into sin. He went away from the Lord. Remember once again that we have the wisest king in the Bible. The wisest king we know in the Bible is King Solomon, but at some point he compromised and he fell into sin. And David is the most successful king. He was the great king in the Bible, but we see him falling into sin. So even you and I, we are not immune to sin. We can fall at any time. We fall at any time. If you think we have people like that, then Psalm 51 has got a share for you. The third category of people uh, that will benefit from this psalm um, are those who think that once you have fallen, and then you can never get back up again. If you think like that, that once you've fallen into sin, you can never get back again, then Psalm 51 is going to give you a message. Because we see David who fell into sin, but the Lord gave him amazing grace to bring him back once again to himself. So this psalm is not for those who think like that. So it is for those who think it is possible to fall beyond the reach of the grace of God. When you fall into sin, you begin to think and say, I am far away. At this point, I don't think God will have mercy on me. At this point, I don't think God will still forgive me. At this point, I don't think I will still get back again and come back to him. If you think like that, then Psalm 51 has got also a share with you because you can never fall into sin far away beyond the grace of this God who always seeks to have mercy on us. And the last part of those people in the category that will benefit Psalm 51 are those who think that if you have fallen into sin and have actually been forgiven, you've gotten back and you are back on track and you've been forgiven, but you are still useless. Useless from the point of both to God, even of the church. If you think like that, because I have fallen into sin, and, and because I know for sure that God has already forgiven me, and I am back on track, but because of my sins, I think I am now useless. I don't think God will actually use me again. I don't think I am useful even to the church and the people of God. If you think like that, then Psalm 51 has got also a share for you. Because we'll see David in Psalm 51, God brought him back and God used him again to be a blessing to others. So these are the three things that I wanted just to bring quickly uh, at the back of your mind as we navigate through the text. Now the text itself, 51, has got um, quite a number of stanzas here, you can see. Uh, chapter 51, verse 1 and 2 is a stanza on its own, and the 3 all the way to 6 is the second stanza, then 7 all the way up to 12 is the third one, 
and then we have the fourth, 13 up to 17, and 18, 19 is another stanza of Psalm 51. But I want us to break it into three major divisions, and then we'll look at those three major divisions uh, in a way that we help us to comprehend the whole psalm of repentance, the psalm written by King David. The first thing I want us to share, number one, number one Psalm 51, David, King David begins with a prayer for pardon from past sin. He begins with a prayer for pardon from past sin. That is from verse 1 all the way to verse 6. Look at, that, at those verses and see how he begins to seek for forgiveness. He is crying for mercy. Look at verse 1. Why do you, in verse 1, have you have mercy on, on me, O oh God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity <coughs> and cleanse me from my sin. So he begins by looking at the basis of uh, forgiveness. Where does he base his, his, his asking, his prayer for mercy? On what basis does David ask for acquittal? Look at those verses once again. He does not appeal to his track record when he's seeking for, for forgiveness as a king of Israel. He's not based his prayer for forgiveness on the good things that he did in the past. He's not reminding God of how many psalms he had written. The psalms that were sung and blessed and they blessed a lot of people. He's not pointing at those records and saying, God, look at the psalms that I've written and have mercy on me. Based on the, on the famous uh, songs that were sung and written by me, Lord, can you have mercy on me? He's not saying that. He's not basing even on his faithful service. Say, God, I've been faithful at some point, and then this is what I did for you. He's not basing his prayer on that one. He does not expect God to forgive him based on his sincerity, because I'm a sincere person. Based on my sincerity, God, forgive me. Or actually on the spiritual intensity of his life. These were not the basis of David's prayer. He didn't even bring the idea of deep pain. God, see how I am in deep pain of my sin. Have a look at this, O oh God, and forgive me. He did not base his prayer of forgiveness on all of those. But it's, it's interesting that he based on the character of God himself. Have a look at chapter 51 again. He says, have mercy on me, O oh God. According to what? And it brings according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant <coughs> mercy. So he bases his prayer on the love of God and the mercy of God. Technically speaking, mercy is on the negative of grace. Grace is when you are shown a favor that you do not deserve. So God is gracious to us when God gives us a favor we do not deserve. So in other words, grace is more on the positive side, giving a favor that you do not deserve. Mercy is the other way around. Mercy is when God withholds a punishment that we deserve. When God withholds a punishment that you deserve, he has shown you mercy. And this is what we see here. David is saying, God, have mercy on me. In other words, I deserve to be punished. But because you are merciful, God, can you withhold that punishment that I deserve? I deserve and, and withhold it, God. He says, God, is because of your love. The love of God which is unconditional. The love of God which is given to people do not deserve. Based on that, God, not on my track record of things that I've done, but based on the fact that you are loving God, you are God of love. You always seek the highest goods of others. This is who you are, the God of love. And you are a merciful God. You do not punish people who deserve to be punished. Based on this, God, have mercy on me. This is a very important aspect of someone who comes to God with a repentant heart. He's not trying to point at A, B, C, D of his accomplishments. He goes to the Lord based on the God, God's character. And if God would forgive you and me, it's not because of how good we are, dear friend. None of us will be able to stand in the presence of this holy, 
holy and holy God. Is a holy God no one can stand. We are all tainted with sin and we are all devastated in our seriousness of sin. No one can stand in the presence of this God. Even our best actions, they are like filthy rags in the presence of this holy God. And therefore, if God would show grace to us, it's because he's a merciful God and he's a God of love. And David goes not to his record, he goes to that character of God and he says, God, please have mercy on me. And this is what we should do whenever we fall. We go to the mercy of the Lord. He's a merciful God. He's God of love. He's going to forgive us because this is who he is. And see how David goes by describing his sin. David is not trying to say what I did is just some kind of trivial mistakes. He's not calling it like that. He's, he's calling what he did what it is. What is it that is it? It is sin. That's what he called. He uses actually three words to describe the sin that he committed. Look at those verses again in verse 1. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot away my what? Transgressions. A willful, self-assertive defiance of God. This is what I did, God. This is what is not just a trivial mistake. It's a transgression that I did. Forgive me and have mercy on that. It's not only transgression, he uses another word which is iniquity. Look at verse 2. Wash me thoroughly from my what? Iniquity. He describes his, his, his crime as iniquity, the guilt that he feels about it. A deviation from the right path. This is what I did. He's not trying to be apologetic at all. He's very straightforward on the sin. He says he calls it sin. It is a transgression, dear God. It is an iniquity that I did before you. And he goes on to say it is actually a sin. Look at that verse once again, verse 2. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. It's not a trivial mistake. It is a sin. It is a missing of the divine mark. This is what I did, God, and have mercy on me. This is an attitude of somebody who comes, you know, in a more sincere way to seek for God's forgiveness. And God who is merciful and will forgive our sin. And I like it. And the next thing you see, David is not neutral in the way he's actually asking for forgiveness. Have you, have you seen that? About five times, David personalized his sins. He's not saying this sin is sin is my sin and the sin of other, another person. Remember this prayer. It's a prayer that came after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. This is the background, actually, if you read right from the beginning of verse 51. After he had committed adultery with Bathsheba and he was confronted by a prophet Nathan, and David now is trying to appropriate the sin. He's not trying to bring anybody else in there. Five times David says, my sins, my this is my sin. Look at those verses. Once again, look at verse, uh, verse 1. It says, blot out my transgressions. They are not neutral. So this is my transgressions, God. Look at verse 2. Wash me thoroughly from what? My iniquity. And in the second line, cleanse me from what? My sin. These are his sins. These are my sins. You know, he brings them before God. Verse 3 says, for I know my transgressions. And he goes on, my sin is not being neutral in the way he comes be before the Lord. He personalizes his, his sins. He's not saying, after all, God, but Sheba was very attractive, you know. She was an accomplice in this particular sin. You know, because it was difficult for me, God, to actually stand. This is the reason why. No, David says, these are my sins. These are my transgressions that I bring before you. He is not trying to be very apologetic. He's not bringing excuses. He's not even rationalizing his sin. He refuses to shift the blame. He gets everything on him. So this is, these are my sins, God. He's not saying, God, wait a minute, God, you know, yes, I sinned, I know I sinned, uh, but you know it takes two to tango, Lord. You know what, by Cheba uh, was very attractive and so forth and so on. After all, she was naked. God, how could I stand? It was, the, he's not coming that way. David is not coming that way. It's not breaking his ears to say maybe, no, I was being denied the conjugal love by my wife. This is the reason why I went this far. No. Five times, David said, these are my transgressions. These are my sins before you. 
He comes in such a way that he knows that I am basing my confession and my prayer to the Lord who is on the one hand the Lord of love and the, the, the Lord God of mercy. David is coming to seek for mercy before the Lord. Now, and then he goes on a little bit. Look at that verse 4. David goes on, he understands the root cause of his problem. He said the problem, this is what he said, the problem is not so much that I sin, but the problem is that I am sinful and I always have been sinful. Look at that verse once again in chapter 1 and in verse uh, 5. He said, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive. Sin is because I am a sinner by nature. This is who we are, dear friends. Sometimes we tend to think we are good people. We are sinners by nature. And in Africa, you know, we have a culture of calling little babies as angels. They are angels, they are innocent, they don't know nothing. But from the biblical perspective, there's no angel. Even those little ones, they are all sinful. We are all born into sin, and sin is part and parcel of who we are. It is so serious. If you don't come to that point of seeing sin as who you are, you will never appreciate the grace of the Lord. You'll never see it that way. And David goes on to say, because I was conceived. The problem is not because I committed adultery. The problem is because my nature is bent away from God and towards sin. This is who am I? Even before I commit any crime, my nature is already bent toward the crime. This is me. This is how we are born. And it goes before the Lord who can be able to forgive sin. David identifies all of these and he comes before the Lord to say, God, please wash me. He pleaded with God, wash me, blot away my sin. In verse 5, in verse, in verse 6, behold, you delight in truth, in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret. And what is David doing here? He's simply making a prayer to ask God to forgive him. It's a prayer of forgiveness. He's being very straightforward. Is not trying to rationalize like one, like what we do most of the time. We rationalize. We tend to bring, we shift blame on others. Like our parents, our first parents, that's what they did. Adam did not admit that he was wrong. He said, yes, I was wrong, but it's because of this woman in heaven. And Eve did not admit that this is my sin. Blame shift. It is because of the serpent. But this is not what we see in Psalm 51. David is not bringing any other person in picture. David says, these are my sins, these are my transgressions, and he goes before God. You know why? It's because David is well informed of the character of God. He knows God has got love and mercy. He will forgive me. He goes before him, and the Lord will forgive him. This is what I need to do. This is what you need to do. Have you fallen into sin, dear friend? Have you committed a crime that you think everybody else will actually not trust you again? Come before the Lord. Come before him. If it means to cry, cry before the Lord. If it means to shed tears, do that before the Lord. He is not as a human being. He is God who is great. His, his mercy is amazing. When you come before him, he will forgive us. He will forgive all our sins. He will bring us back again. All of us seated here, we are all sinners by nature. We commit terrible things. But dear friend, we have hope in this God. Come before him, the Lord Jesus Christ. We will forgive you once again. The next thing that David does now, David has prayed for past sin, but it's not where he ended. He knows for sure that God is the one who has got the right for judgment, he knows that God is the one who will charge him. That's the reason why in that verse he says, it is against you and you only have I sinned. It is in the context of judgment David comes uh, before God. Because every sin that we do against our friends or against anyone, ultimately is a sin that we sin against God. And David comes, he says, against you and you only have I, have I sinned. This is a, a, a true picture of repentance, a heart of seeking God for mercy. 
The second thing David does here, he proceeds now to ask God to give him power to walk in future purity. That's the second thing David does. He's not just seeking God, pardon me, but God give me power to walk in future purity. You will do well to forgive my sin in the past, but what about the future? How am I going to stand again? There's a possibility of me going back again and do the same thing. It begins with impassioned plea for ceremonial cleansing. He said, God, cleanse me. Look at verse 7. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow, because I am unclean. Actually, the word to wash, wash there is used in a ceremonial sense, because he believes I am unclean. I cannot stand in the presence of this holy God. Friends, whenever we are brought face to face with the true nature of the gospel, the first thing you realize is how dirty you are. And the moment you are far away from this God is when you tend to think you are okay, you are better. I am better than that particular student. I know I am a sinner, but I'm not like my mother. I know I'm a sinful person, but not like my wife. But the moment you are brought face to face with the true picture of the gospel, you will never see any other person in picture. You will see that you are the worst of all people. And you are in need of God's grace. This is what happened in the Old Testament. When Isaiah was given a glimpse of glory, a glimpse of glory, he was brought in the presence of the holy, holy God. And the seraphims, the burning ones, they were singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And all the gates were shaking because of the majesty and the magnitude of this God. That glimpse of glory that was given to Isaiah, and Isaiah says, woe to me, because I am a man of uncleanness, and I dwell among people of uncleanness. That's what happens when you are face to face with the gospel, even when you are seated there. When the Holy Spirit brings the reality of the gospel to you, you will never see the person next to you as a sinner. You will see yourself as dirty and unclean in the presence of this holy God. Peter, in the New Testament, is brought face to face with the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus tells Peter, what is going on? Peter said, we've been trying to catch fish the whole night, and we couldn't, God. And they didn't realize that they were actually standing in the presence of the holy Jesus. And Jesus tells them, do this and you'll be able to get what you're looking for. And there was a miraculous catch. It's only then Peter realized that I am actually standing in the presence of God. And what did Peter say? He said, away from me because I'm a sinful man. This is what happens. Every time you come across the gospel, you realize how dirty you are in need and desperation in need of salvation. You won't bring any other person in picture. You look at yourself as a desperate person and miserable who is in need of salvation. You won't bring all those accomplishments you do. I go to church, I sing, I'm a member of a choir or anything like that. David did not bring all of these things. In the presence of the Holy God, he says, wash me, God, because I'm unclean. Cleanse me, God, because I do not deserve to stand in your presence. This is what he's is, 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 is asking. But he goes on to say, God, I may go back to the same thing. It is one thing to be forgiven. But God, I also need power to walk through the path of righteousness. Look at what he prays now. He, say, he goes in verse 9, hide your face from, hide your face from me, my, uh, your, uh, hide your face from my sins, in verse 9, and blot out my iniquity. But look at verse 10 now. This is where he goes on now. He seeks for God to give him power. He says, create in me a clean heart. This is where I get the power to overcome the sinful tendencies. God, I need something new in me. Create in me a clean heart. Not something old, but a new thing in me, oh God. In verse 10, he goes on to say, renew a right spirit in me. Because if you do not do this, God, I will get back to my sinful tendencies. Give me power to live a righteous life by renewing in me a right spirit within myself. And in, in verse 11, he goes on to say, you know what, God, cast me not away from your presence. 
I really need to stand in your presence. I need that fellowship. I always need to be with you. Do not push me away from your presence. He's looking for God to give him the power to live a Christian life. So as believers, it's one thing to say, God, forgive me. But it's another thing to seek for God to empower us to live a righteous life. This is what David is doing in the second part of his prayer. Because he knows that he is still a sinner. He was born in sin. He will tremble. He will, he will fall into sin once again. But dear friend, you know in Christ we have power to overcome our sinful desires. Did you hear that song that we sang at the beginning? Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Have you washed yourself in the blood of the Lamb? And it's calling all of us, have you been there? If you've been there, you will see the grace of God on your life. All the time. This is what we see. David is asking for the power. And the Bible says, walk by the Spirit, and you will never fulfill the desires of the flesh. God has given us power, friend. We have been saved not only from sin as presence, but we have saved also from the power and the dominion of sin. We are still sinful on earth, but God gives us power. Every time, pray that God will help you. You come before him and the Lord will give you the strength so that you may go in righteousness. And look at verse 12. It says, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Because this is what we lose. If you are a true Christian and you fall into sin, you will never have this joy we are talking about. So the joy of the true believer is not connected to what they have. It's not connected to material things. It's connected to your relationship with God. When that fellowship with God, your creator, is broken and you are a true Christian, you will lose the joy of salvation. Even when you have enough money with you or material possessions like King David, but the joy is lost. Because our joy is not connected to what we have. It's connected to how we are in a fellowship with God. Have you found sin and you have still have the joy? You are at peace. There's something wrong, brother, with you. Whether you are a member of a choir where you come from, or you are a son of a pastor or a daughter of a pastor, those are not credentials for you to become a Christian. For you to know that you are a believer, once you come to fall into sin, how do you feel? A true believer, when he has fallen or she has fallen into sin, at that particular point onward, they become miserable. They lose the joy of salvation. And David is a king here. He's got all the comfort around him. But he says, God, you know what? I, am, I don't have the joy. Restore the joy of salvation. Because sin robs that away from us. A true believer, even when you are going through adversity and difficult moments, but because you are in good terms with God, the Lord will supply the joy that you can never explain. He will walk side by side with you. David is not asking for God to give him salvation again. No, because we do not lose salvation. We lose the joy of that salvation. In verse 12, restore to me the joy of your salvation. In verse 11, it says, actually, God, do not take your Holy Spirit away from me. This Holy Spirit is not in the sense of the saving power or maybe the power to live a righteous life. It is in the area of ministry that that anointing of helping me to save your people as a king, do not take it away because it goes away as a believer. You know, when you fall into sin, even the power for effective ministry is lost. Everything you do becomes mechanic, forcing things. It is gone because you are no longer in good terms with this God. This is what David is asking when he says, do not take the Holy Spirit away. Because we still need the Holy Spirit to help us in the ministry that God has given us. Lastly, dear friends, David concludes now by making a vow before the Lord. He said, you know what, God, if you happen to forgive me and you give me power to walk in righteous life, then once again you will use me to bless others. Look at verse 13. Then, then I shall teach transgressors your ways. David is going to be still useful before the Lord. 
and I will teach sinners, and the sinners will return to you. Who is this person that God is going to use so that sinners can come back to God? The same David. The same David who compromised and fell into sin, God has brought him back and he is still useful in the hands of the Lord. God can still use those brothers that sometimes we sideline, we tend to think because at some point they fell into sin, therefore they are useless, they cannot be used. No! God will bring them back. He forgives them, he washes them with the blood of the Lord. They become whiter than snow. He uses them again for the glory of his name. And if you are there, you tend to think, I will never get back again, and I will still be useless and something. No. Psalm 51 is encouraging you to come back again. You will be a testimony to other people, and God will use you to advance his glory. And so, friend, I am here to tell you that we need to be people who are repentant, people who are ready to confess all our sins and, become, and come to this God of hope who can forgive all our sins. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much because we've got hope. Hope in the Lord Jesus. Hope of forgiveness. In as much as we know how desperate we are, we know how, how depraved we are, but we've got hope when we come before you. That God, you will forgive all our transgressions, all our iniquities, and all our sins. I pray that God, your spirit will work in us as we hear this word that we will be encouraged to come once again to the source, to the fountain, the fountain of blessing. The Lord Jesus Christ, wash us again and give us the power to get back again and to save you. May your Holy Spirit be in us so that we may stand again and look up to you, Lord, as we work for the sake of your kingdom. Amen. Amen.